Hey there, Rob. <laughs> what a great score. I really love how you ticked a lot of the boxes in my criteria screens without even ever having seen them, right? And addressed a lot of those concerns. And you know, obviously thinking kind of on parallel tracks with me with things like the um, adding a little bit of a lower tone right in here to address the problem of such a long expanse of time, 45 seconds, uh, of music being placed in the upper register of the piano or the upper middle register of the piano, kind of limiting the, you know, the scope. And then also having the emotion of the orchestration evolve from bar to bar. Then on this next page, you know, keeping the uh, the interpretation of the left hand patterns from becoming too predictable, and instead of expanding the scope of the of the orchestration, you you sort of expanded the sound picture. You know, the, this lovely piccolo on top and so on. You, you added, you made use of empty space to to bring out more important elements. So it's just all really really great and and really enjoyable to look at and you know another diverting score <laughs> to keep me from getting too stuck into into one particular kind of frame of mind as a coach right now that that's really helpful i'm really loving how different everybody's score is from everybody else right here at the beginning so we're starting off here with uh melody in the upper heavy brass uh first trumpet and tenor trombones playing that little chordal melody and of course there's no need for an octave partner above the first trumpet because the um the overtones from the trumpet uh, there's there's already a really strong um overtone on the octave that doesn't mean that like it sounds like a trumpet is playing octaves but the sense of that pitch being there is present without it having to be underlined. <clears throat> now a couple of little um, notation things. Watch out for leaving out um, the um, the triple beam. I, I don't know, maybe this is a Dorico thing. You can, you know, you just sort of set it to sound tremolo and it, you know, if you accidentally leave out the triple beam tremolo, then it still sounds tremolo. It's kind of strange or sounds rolled. Then here at this suspended cymbal roll, um, maybe you needed to boost it up to this height in order to <clears throat> in order to activate the sound from the sound sets. I, I don't know what, but you know, just sort of drop it a little bit. It's interesting how it had sort of a hissing sound um, rather than that beautiful kind of um, kind of whooshing kind of a sound that uh, you know, this kind of kind of like a murmuring whoosh. Uh, from a from a beautiful like 17 inch or 20 inch dish so yeah anyways I mean that could be improved but whatever it is just drop it back down when you're done all right um, and you know a couple other little things no need to put in you know a, a bar number every few bars or whatever just just have it at the beginning so first page zero you know or nothing next page um, I guess uh, bar 11 right okay so <clears throat> to get back to the orchestration here I feel that this works really really nicely this sort of sense of suspense right uh, you, with a with a proper sound of a cymbal roll it would sound really really great and there's there's kind of a question about like stochastic resonance you know what does the what does a rolled cymbal do to um, push certain elements of the um, of the harmonic spectrum in other instruments of the overtones of other instruments and what does it do to absorb them right so anyway something to think about a little bit I think there needs to be more research on that I've mentioned that in 100 orchestration tips now we've got um, glockenspiel it's, it's lovely like it you know like you're giving us a bigger scope of sound picture by having this on top and just you know giving lots of space in between right so we're we're jumping up an octave you know da da from this lower um this lower incarnation 
right? And yet it doesn't feel like too big of a leap because of the, you know, once again, because of the strong overtone on top, you know, an octave higher than the, than the um, root pitch or the fundamental pitch of that note, right? Um, it, but, you know, with the clarinets right under the uh, flutes and oboes, it's, it's a really nice combination right in there. Uh, and then first oboe playing octaves with, uh, with the trumpet. If, if the trumpet were to be muted, then you'd have this really beautiful um, kind of uh, early impressionistic, late romantic kind of a combination sound. Um, so you say two trombones here, and then I think you've got the bass trombone part right in here, this G and this C. So, so actually this note should start here, right? In bass trombone. So, and it ties through, and just the way that it's scored in the piano is the way to do it, right? So it's not G, G, it's G and lift up from the G while the G keeps holding, right? And then C. And then I don't think there's any need to tie these two or to tie to slur between these two pitches. I think it's it's better when you hit this not to slur up to it, but uh, you know, the, the trombonist is going to actually probably tongue this anyways, right? So, or I mean, I think they could actually slur I'm trying to think of my, um, they could possibly slur that, but I think it's better to add the emphasis of tonguing, subtle as that is, to this uh, middle bar. Um, ba -da -da -da, uh, that's all nice. I think you can, once again, I think you can tongue on the, on the downbeat here rather than slurring into it. I think that's just better. Okay, but question here is, we have the oboe continuing on and the trumpet kind of giving way underneath it, right? So I, I'm not so sure that l taking the support out right here is, is good for the oboe. Maybe if you were to have the same, like the same dynamic, or sorry, the same duration of both notes and they like, maybe the, the first trumpet could fade out a little underneath it, like have a have a hairpin down to, you know, pianissimo or something like that. I think that would be better than just dropping out right here. Okay, and then going on, we're, you know, back to clarinets plus oboes, but like, at a, you have now this big gap in between. And, and here's where I think, like, you have to really think about that gap, right? Um, the richness of the overtones of your uh, first and second horn are going to fill in a little bit of this space, right? So if you were thinking that, then that is one of the outcomes. But, you know, would, would it, is there, you know, is this an, one of those awkward separations, right? That, that we start to hear in, in some scoring, um, like some piano scoring of Beethoven where he starts to get farther and farther apart with his hands and not really caring caring about filling in things, right? It has like a, it has a, a kind of a, there's a certain, not emptiness to it, there's a certain sense of almost enforced space, right? So so if that's intentional, it's all cool. Uh, and, and those are kind of higher, thinner notes, right? And then here you're adding the piccolo on top and that's a really beautiful combination, but it is really going to underline the, um, the, the more intense quality, right, in both instruments. But having said that, it's very simple for the, for the piccolo to keep this soft, right? The C is going to be a little bright, but it, it is all, all possible to play this. I think <clears throat> as nuanced and as, as beautifully careful as you were with the dynamics here, I still think you could have added more nuance to to these individual phrases, right? Um, da, 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 da. Right, don't just leave it up to the player. Just add, you know, like you, you push into the middle of the bar and pull out again. And you know, there's, there's just a bunch of different things you could do here. And then, um, as I've mentioned in other evaluations, do we really want, you know, just because it was in the piano part, right? A piano being a, a percussion instrument, basically, <clears throat> the hammers are going to strike on the downbeat uh, and they're going to add that element of emphasis, whether you slur them or not. 
but then the same is not true of a wind instrument right or a string instrument so the slurring across it robs the downbeat of its emphasis so I mean do you really want that right do you want each time for the you know to slur into the downbeat or slur over the downbeat rather than to actually play the downbeat just you know something and then here the your slurring your you know the breathing here doesn't match between the instruments I think that it has to right okay so just think about that a little bit this is lovely right in here this you know this little fabric this of the of the horns so yeah you know, maybe manage the um, the dynamics a little bit more here like we have a diminuendo and like shouldn't all all the instruments diminuendo right um, and uh, you know we're just sort of missing um, a few elements here at the end it, it just doesn't feel like a very filled in interpretation of what happened in the piano part uh, having said that though there's a beautiful simplicity to it though I mean, I'm not gonna say that it's that it's wrong or or but it may be you know you just might be missing one or two things that that could go in there but all the same I really do like the kind of more delicate feeling right in there uh, and and I think for the for the most part it works but I would hold back dynamically a little bit on your heavy brass right in here so yeah just and and make it make their the entrance and exit feel a little bit more subtle especially you know with the delicacy what you go what you have going on above right so like you you want to ease in you're trying to ease in here from the clarinets into the trombones and the, the, the thing about it is that you know they're they're not the most um they're not the most complementary instruments, right? Clarinets and horns, and you know, clarinets and bassoons and and bassoons and horns, right? Those are more natural partners. But clarinets and trombones is not quite as seamless, right? In terms of a of a trade off. So, once again, you have to manage this diminuendo and then this crescendo in, right? So, like, if you want to get that really beautiful trade off or beautiful um, yeah, dovetailing. Yeah, and yeah, just really, I would, you know, and, and then right in here, like you're filling in that extra information and then trading over to first clarinet. So there has to be some kind of compensation right in here, some kind of, you know, dovetailing or, or more natural transition between these two voices in order to make this work, I think, just to, to have the kind of seamlessness of it. All right, so on the next screen, it's very cool. I, I just have so many things to say about it, but like this is my fourth try <laughs> in recording this, and you know, I just I've had my computer crash three times in a row, or was it four times in a row? But I'm not giving up on you, Rob. I'm, damn it, I want to do this evaluation, so I'm gonna do it. Okay, so, <clears throat> so yeah, so uh, soft mallets on the timpani. I think you indicated that before. Um, so yeah, but it doesn't hurt to mention it again. I, I like, I like that just like a little bit. Like you just you're adding a little bit, and it's on the you know it's just on a very limited range of pitches, and it's soft, right? And it's not like doing anything. It's, you're not jumping octaves or or really you know doubling the the um, the patterns too you know uh, too in too of too much of an overemphasized way. Now here, yeah, that this is the right way to score it. But like, what do you mean by slurring this repeated note? Right? What does that mean to the player who is bowing this? So here, you like, what if they didn't have the low D? Uh, they didn't have an extension. They didn't have a fifth string, and they're playing now. They're playing three Ds in a row, and there's a slur over each of them. So what does that mean? Right? So you have to think about what that would be. I would just slur the first one, right? And that way, you can start on this, and then the you know, like you start the note and at the same time as the cellos, right? Rather than the cellos starting on a note that's already slurred from previous, which kind of doesn't. At best, there would be some kind of portato happening here, where the where the player just kind of kind of added a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a pulse to the uh, to the bow to the same bow direction. But I, you know, once again, it's just like oh, that's needlessly fussy. Just slur the two notes and then don't slur across the repeated note, okay? It's just so much easier on the player. Now, these are really big, long 
slurs. And the other thing about it is, even though you have got a piano dynamic, and so the the bow has the you know it has the requisite energy you know li limited energy in order to bow for longer. <clears throat> You're still covering a lot of ground here. Like, you know, it's just really kind of arcing back and forth over the uh, over the uh, the range of the strings and the fingerboard for the for the left hand. And you know why that all that is negotiable. Uh, you know, is it is it um, is it something that you really want? You know, I mean, wouldn't it be better just to go like, okay, so slur this, and then a new separate, a new separate bow on this, then slur these three notes, and then slur just slur each group, right? Um, then here you got a repeated note, right? So maybe you could go slur, slur, repeated note, no slur, and then this, right? So that way you could get like a up, excuse me, a down, up down, up kind of a thing. So just kind of trading back and forth between bow directions. Now, what's lovely is that you start off with just timpani and low strings, and then you add bass clarinet as the partner, right? And then kind of, you sort of poop out right in here. The bass clarinet could keep going and like, they could play all day, right? Uh, just as long as you give them a place to breathe here and there. <clears throat> So uh, yeah, so I, you didn't need to drop out there in terms of the doubling, but it, it's it's kind of cool, like the you know, adding that quality and then da, 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 and adding the piccolo on top here. That's so lovely, like because it really it reminds you of the space in between, right? That's and you know you sort of you sort of feel that empty hall, that empty space. Um, and then here we, we're you know we're trading off to contrabassoon, trading off to clarinet, and so on. Um, and then once again we have repeated note, right? Um, what does that mean? So so yeah, so like you you might want to go you know da, 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 you know just just divide them up a little bit. I mean it's not that that the repeated notes under a slur never happen or that they shouldn't, but I mean it's. I mean, it's just happening so much, right? And I'm seeing it a lot in these arrangements. It, it, would be, it would be nice if the default approach of the orchestrators were to not do that, but only occasionally, it's like, like most of the time, there isn't a slur over repeated notes, but sometimes there is in a place where there's kind of no other option. And then when there, and when that happens, like maybe there's portato markings or, or, you know, or slurred staccato or some other kind of a thing where there is definitely an articulation intended for each repeated note, right? So just, just think about some of those things. <clears throat> this is really cool. So, you know, bass clarinet making a return. And it, you know, what's nice is just like, there's no bassoon really doubling any of this stuff yet. Right. And then just like little touches here. A, I think that that's so cool. Like the accent is staccato, mezzo piano, makes really good sense right in here. <clears throat> I think that you could have nuanced these phrases as well a little bit. You know, just breathed into them, pulled out of them a little bit, right? Especially when the piccolo comes in here, just you know, make it make it live. Give it a little bit of energy in the middle, right? Just and you could even mark piano espressivo. So you just like that. So that. Piccolo just emerges like this beautiful bird song over the top of the sunny day, you know. Okay, and then and then you know, in same thing in here, like your clarinets are pushing into this to a mezzo forte, <clears throat> mezzo piano. Shouldn't this crescendo as well to a mezzo forte, or even from piano to mezzo forte? Because <clears throat> nobody will have any problem hearing the piccolo up here at all. Yeah, and then, you know, and yeah, I just, I felt that right in here, like, I almost felt like this started a little early, like, you know, it could have, like, even started from the middle of the bar and just kind of whooshed into this, right? Or maybe even whooshed into right here, right? So, um, it just it just felt a little long to me. <clears throat> so, you, you have this strange thing, four horns, <coughs> excuse me. And then you have first and second on separate staves. So, uh, generally speaking, the first and the second would be on the top staff, right? And they would be working together. And there's and seeing as how 
essentially everything is being played with the same um, at the same rhythm, the same phrasing, everything else. Um, these this could be all expressed as um, you know intervals, just like the clarinets here, right? So I I would just have both the second and first on the same staff, like they should be, and then you then you can just save a staff. You don't need the horns in here. Now you know just generally speaking, Rob, this could have had a much larger. Uh, much larger size a staff size and 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 font size and everything else um just just looking at the scope of it and it would be even easier to read on screen not that it's hugely difficult but it's still you know every notch helps um in the readability especially since you know some people their their only chance to watch this will be on like a um a tablet or a or a um or their phone or something like that. So they might have to just guess on what I'm pointing at at that small of a size. Uh, however, I you know I do recommend that people watch these lectures on their um, like on their television, right? If they can at all possible get the you know on a modern television, you could get the YouTube app and then just go to my channel and then watch these, and you just have all of my lectures in big beautiful. <laughs> You know, high resolution, uh, real easy to read, see what I'm pointing at, and so on. And of course, like a, a laptop, uh, or excuse me, a desktop screen also works pretty good too. All right, so yeah, so yeah, so here I feel. I mean, I mean, this will work, but I would actually mark the horns at piano. Right, piano, mezzo forte, oboe, right, and then they should both have a crescendo here, right, and then and then if you're gonna go to mezzo forte, ya da da da, um, then then right in here, I think that the you know if you're gonna get that hot with your horns, I think that the wind should crescendo to. Um, to like a, a forte, right? And then they can all sort of pull back together. Um, just, a, just a little note here on notation. You wanna break the, um, <clears throat> you wanna uh, break the uh, bar line between the, uh, the brass and the winds. <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, it, it, I like the idea of space. I like trading off of the different, the different instruments. I think I think right in here, like the the cellos could have a little bit of support from somebody, you know, um, right? I mean, see, like here you use the clarinet, right? And then here you kind of can't use it. So what if, and, and here you're using bassoon and so on and so forth. What's the English horn doing? Uh, they could cover some of these pitches, right? And certainly from here to there, Right, or they could actually play this. They could go like um, E slur up to C, and then back, and then do this. You know, and and those lower notes are much easier. I was just talking about slurring from B in the previous lecture, and for uh, for English horn, it's a, it's a bit quite a bit easier. Um, but yeah, but maybe these notes could be covered by the English horn or something. So like you'd kind of keep going with adding a little bit of strength, a little bit of color to these um, to these cello lines, um, continuing to trade off, you know, bass clarinet could come back again. And then here you have contrabassoon, right? So um, that's kind of strange, a to contrabassoon, right? So I think that that's a maybe copy paste error or something, yeah. So, and then this, this works out great, the clarinets. So yeah, so I mean, it's just like one, you know, it, it's just so charming and, and so imaginative and you know, a little bit sort of like Emily Emily score from a few, uh, a few evaluations before I feel like I'm kind of giving you editing advice <laughs> as much as I'm giving you orchestration advice. And, uh, you know, I just, I really like the, um, <coughs> the overall approach. Uh, one little thing is, I think that the violas could keep going, like doubling the ch the the clarinets right in here, and then and the and then the horns just to sort of keep um, 
keep the sort of the string sound right there in the middle and it actually helps the rest of the string section to sort of hear that middle voice amongst them as as much as it is from the other instruments but you know having said that you can completely disregard that idea if you like the idea of more space but in that case you still just really do have to balance these horns and so on all right and you know i mean better to start from piano to crescendo to mezzo forte than mezzo piano right just to have you know have more of a curve to your nuances right so either have the nuance be like subtle like a, like a small thing you know just kind of pushing and coming back but if you really are going to change you know if you're going to push so much that you are changing the dynamic the dynamic strength like from cool to warm and so on make it more like you know like piano is it's just better to go from piano to mezzo forte or mezzo piano to like or to forte or something like that so just to to just to have like more of a curve right have a more of a dynamic um uh, pulse or push right anyway um so those are my thoughts on your score rob um so once again happy birthday and um and yeah just so fun such great ideas and um you know, a lot of things like sort of right in the right place at the right time in ways that i completely did not even think about or consider in my own score and uh and yeah just and just like the last uh evaluation a very likable entry great work on that thank you so much for supporting the channel it's hugely appreciated and you know thanks to everybody out there watching this video and participating in the challenge at whatever level and you know please uh, please um offer rob some of your thoughts below you know any anything that you think would help him to make this approach stronger or any alternate ideas that you might have and you know in any any way you can help him out because you know he's obviously got great ideas and and a and a wonderful imagination and uh and and a you know a burgeoning sense of craft and so on all of those great things that i'm seeing in these in these entries and that ought to be encouraged as much as possible. So thanks so much. And uh, I think if I can keep my computer from crashing, that I have got one more evaluation in me. So if you have the time, please join me in the next and last of the minimum level entries for the 2022 Orchestration Challenge. <laughs>